Now, <clears throat> what we do next, I like to think of it as we've built a cardiovascular system now, right? You know, we, um, we had to get through the muscle stuff and the autonomic nervous system stuff in order to get all of our pieces to a physiologically active cardiovascular system. And what I mean by that is, ultimately, we as human beings, we do lots of different things. We, we put our bodies into a variety of different um, metabolic need states. So the body has to be able to adapt fairly dramatically to extremes. You know, we have to be able to go from having efficient resting metabolism, like you guys all have right now, to being able to go out and sprint, run, swim, bike, whatever, right? So in order to do that, we, we have to take our cardiovascular system and we have to exercise some control over it based on what is happening to the body. And we have multiple levels of control. Today, we're gonna to talk about local and humoral control. After the test, we're gonna talk about nervous system control, and then we're gonna start putting those things together. <clears throat> All of it, in the end, builds on what we've already talked about. So remember, autoregulation. Autoregulation is the notion that a capillary bed, the arterioles and the, the pre-capillary sphincters, um, will dilate in response to low oxygen, high CO2, low pH, high temperature, right? Everything we talk about from here on out, that is still going to trump everything else, okay? So what happens at the local tissue level is the biggest effect for that tissue, for the tissue in question, right? So this, the whole control of the cardiovascular system is built on one idea. Maintain a blood pressure. Because as long as there's sufficient blood pressure in the cardiovascular system, autoregulation will take care of where that blood flow goes, right? By putting the blood flow into the tissues that need it most. So what we're going to be talking about is how, number one, does autoregulation work. We'll talk a little bit about that today. And then most of the rest of it is how do we maintain a blood pressure? How does the body defend, as I'll say, how does it defend a blood pressure against changes from the outside? All right, so <clears throat> the uh, body maintains a blood pressure sufficient to allow tissues to choose their own blood flow. The beauty of this system is the brain doesn't have to know which tissues are busy and which are not. The tissues handle that all by themselves. It gives the brain much less to do and makes our cardiovascular system able to adapt much more readily. So acute control is autoregulation. Rapid changes to meet moment to moment changes in the needs of the body. Now today we are gonna talk a little bit about long-term control. And what I mean there is how many blood vessels you have and how big those blood vessels are, well, that's not something that can change in a second or two, right? Because you're gonna have to build new structure. But we need to have a control system for that too so that a busy muscle, a muscle we use all the time, has a better blood supply than one that we don't use very often, right? So that includes angiogenesis or growing new vessels. So acute control is what we've talked about before. The big four, decreased oxygen, increased temperature, decreased pH, increased CO2. All of those things trigger vasodilation. We're gonna look at two theories for how that happens later today. Now there are other compounds that will trigger vasodilation. So for example, potassium tends to lead to vasodilation. It's a direct re, uh, response to membrane potential change, right? If we put a bunch of potassium around a cell, we change the concentration gradient, right? So we change the nurse potential. Phosphate compounds do this. Adenosine compounds do this. That's part of the energy economy, right? If we have a place that has lots of adenosine around, what's probably happened is a lot of ATP has been burned all the way down to adenosine, right? Same with phosphate compounds. Phosphates are our high energy um, uh, molecular bonds. 
So when we have low energy phosphate, it tends to cause vasodilation, bringing more um, <coughs> uh, blood to that area. So the way we have talked about autoregulation so far, I have presented you the vasodilator theory, which is there are a number of compounds which directly cause vasodilation, right? Hydrogen ions do, so a decrease in pH. CO2 does, an increase in CO2. High temperature does, and low oxygen does. So we call this the vasodilator theory, that um, the response, or, or sorry, that blood flow is increased by the presence of vasodilators. And those vasodilators happen to be the outcomes of a busy tissue. So what we see experimentally is a graph that looks a little bit like this. So when our tissue has a normal rate of metabolism, so rate of metabolism on the x-axis, blood flow on the y-axis. So when a tissue is normally busy, you know, in other words, it's at its normal state of affairs, kind of like you all are right now, well, we see that the blood flow is um, one times normal, not surprising. Well, if we increase the metabolism of a tissue, in other words, if we go from one to four, we see that blood flow increases as the metabolism goes up. This fits with the vasodilator theory. More metabolism, more vasodilators. More vasodilators, more vasodilation. Okay? Now, we have a different theory. Explains the same phenomena. All right? It's just going to explain it a little bit more elegantly. And here, we call this the oxygen demand theory. And it goes like this. Vasoconstriction, in other words, the precapillary sphincters and the arterioles, in order to stay small, they require energy, right? Because there's pressure passing through these vessels all the time. That pressure is trying to blow them open. Well, the oxygen demand theory says that, um, that vasodilation occurs when the vasoconstrictors are not getting what they need to continue to constrict. So it's kind of like the vasodilator theory looked at in the opposite direction. So if we have a, a precapillary sphincter, okay, so imagine just one, it's tightly constricted. Well, if that tissue, if the tissue downstream of that precapillary sphincter, if it becomes really busy, well, that precapillary sphincter, the oxygen available to it and the metabolites available to it are going to drop off because the tissue is going to use them up. Well, when the oxygen and nutrients disappear, that cell has no choice but to dilate because it doesn't have what it needs to constrict anymore, right? So the oxygen demand theory says that vasodilation occurs when vasoconstrictors don't get the, the resources they need to stay constricted. So it kind of takes away the, the idea that, well, how does a cell know if the CO2 is elevated, let's say? Could there be a mechanism for that? Sure there could. Or it could simply be that it doesn't know the CO2 is elevated. It just knows that it doesn't have what it needs to continue to constrict, so it dilates. The secondary result of that is more blood flow comes in, more oxygen, more nutrients, now it can constrict again. See, and it does. So we talked yesterday about how flow through the capillaries is intermittent, right? It's on and off and on and off and on and off. That actually fits better with the oxygen demand theory than it does with the vasodilator theory. Because essentially what's happening is when those um, constrictors, when the precapillary sphincters have the resources they need, they're small. When they don't have the resources they need, they dilate and let more resources in. That makes them bigger, but then the tissue uses it up and it gets smaller again. So we get bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. So this is the oxygen demand theory, that uh, relaxation occurs not because of specific factors being present, but because of nutrients not being present, right? So that's the oxygen demand theory. And 
Like I said, there are two ways to describe the same phenomena. That's as far down the rabbit hole as we're going to go. We're not going to try to distinguish, well, which is the more accurate theory. It doesn't really matter. We're clinicians, right? So we want to know that autoregulation works and a little bit about how it works. OK, so whether you look at it as vasodilation or um, the absence of constriction, like oxygen demand theory, we still get this phenomena called hyperemia. And it goes a little bit like this. OK, so if we have, um, uh, let's see, what do we have here? We have time along the x-axis. We have times, or uh, <clears throat> how much blood flow, you know, normal blood flow, twice blood flow, three times normal, right? So in times normal. OK, now let's make something happen. So we're here at 1, and we squeeze on an artery. So we're going to squeeze that artery closed. So that means the tissues distal to that artery are not getting the supplies that they need. They're not getting oxygen, they're not getting nutrients, and they're not having their waste products um, <coughs> removed. Okay, So we hold that occlusion for a couple of seconds, then we let it go. What we see experimentally is that blood flow doesn't just go back to normal. It goes way, way, way above normal. And we call that response reactive hyperemia. It fits with both vasodilator and oxygen demand theory. If we've squeezed off an artery, we have kept the resources away from the vasoconstrictors, right? So by the time we release that occlusion, all the vessels in that area are going to be wide open because they've been starved for their stuff, right? On the vasodilator theory side, the area distal to our occlusion will have built up CO2, will have built up um, hydrogen ions, so low pH, and the temperature is likely to be higher. All those things cause vasodilation. So after a period of occlusion, we get a period of brisk blood flow called reactive hyperemia. It's, it really is what we're, these patterns are from autoregulation. We're starving a tissue for a moment and then feeding it again. Well, it's going to eat a whole bunch and then go back to normal until it, once it's covered its, um, its debt, right? Now, this is an example of blocking an artery. We can do the same thing by increasing metabolism. So here we are at normal. If we contra uh, contract or stimulate a muscle, obviously when muscle contracts, it's going to um, use more uh, resources, right? So we see the blood flow go up during muscle stimulation. And then once we stop muscle stimulation, the blood flow doesn't drop right back down. It sort of works its way back down, right? So we call this active hyperemia, that when a tissue is busy, it gets more blood flow than when it isn't busy, right? So these are the context here is these are two proofs that autoregulation really does happen, that tissues, individual regions of the body, control their own blood flow by managing vasodilation and vasoconstriction to match blood flow to the body's needs, right? So hyperemia is, is just an example of that. All right. Up till this point, we have kind of considered blood pressure to be a constant. You know, when we're looking at the tissues, a particular tissue with vasodilator theory or oxygen demand theory, um, we're assuming that the blood pressure created by the heart is constant. Well, we know that that's an invalid assumption. Blood pressure does, in fact, change. So what happens at the local tissue level when blood pressure goes up or down? Well, we have all the facts we need to work our way through this. OK, so if blood pressure in the body goes up, all over, we're going to have an increase in blood flow through the capillaries. Why? Because we've increased our pressure gradient, right? So we've, we're literally pushing more blood flow through the capillaries. All right, so it means that all over the body will have a very brief period of increased blood flow. Well, when we increase the blood flow to a tissue, we bring extra oxygen, we remove more CO2, 
<coughs> that, um, uh, and we bring in more nutrients. All of those things cause vasoconstriction. So when your systemic blood pressure goes up, you do get increased blood flow, but it's stopped very quickly by your vasoconstrictors that now got a big burst of extra blood flow and nutrients, right? So it means that um, a an upward change in blood pressure results in an increase in the amount of constriction that's present in all your capillaries. So we, our tissues can respond to a systemic blood pressure change. Now let's look at it the opposite. Your blood pressure falls. That means all over the body, you're going to have a reduction in blood flow through your capillaries. Well, that is going to lead to vasodilation, right? So now we'll have more dilated capillaries, more dilated valves, that will mean a smaller pressure like we have in the body will be sufficient to get the blood flow because we've reduced resistance. So all, um, distributed, our capillary beds can respond to increases and decreases in blood pressure. Their response, put it back the way that it was. Now, two theories behind this response. The metabolic theory is the one we've already talked about, right? That is blood flow increases, um, uh, or the increase in blood flow increases the oxygen and pH and decreases CO2. So we have a reduction in vasodilation. In other words, constriction. This is in the upward, you know, blood pressure has gone up. Another theory that we haven't talked about yet is the myogenic theory. And it goes like this, that smooth muscle can sense and respond to stretch. It does this all the time in the GI tract, so we know that it can do this. Well, the smooth muscle in the walls of the vessel, when blood pressure goes up, it's going to get stretched out a little bit, right, by the increased hydrostatic pressure. The response of smooth muscle to stretch is contraction. Remember, smooth muscle wants to hold its shape regardless of what's happening. So when these muscle cells in the arteries get stretched out, their response is to contract harder. That is essentially vasoconstriction, right? So when systemic blood pressure goes up, we get an increase in vasoconstriction because of the smooth muscle stretch. So we know both happen. We know that the metabolic um, changes cause vasodilation and vasoconstriction. We know that smooth muscle itself does. Generally speaking, the metabolic trumps the myogenic. In other words, the effect of metabolites like CO2 and pH are greater than the effect of smooth muscle maintaining its size and shape. It kind of has to be that way in order for autoregulation to still work. You know, in the end, the precapillary sphincters have to control blood flow through the um, capillary bed. Now we've got a couple of special cases in the body. Yeah. Um, quick question. So these theories, the metabolic and myogenic theories, this is happening just at the capillaries. This isn't referring to the vessels throughout the entire body. It, it is referring to the arterioles and the precapillary sphincters. Okay. So the vessels just ahead of the capillaries. Okay. Capillaries don't have the equipment to vasoconstrict oh. okay. um, because they, they don't have smooth muscle in their walls. So we're talking about the, the, the valve vessels, the vessels right before those. Okay. Very good question. Okay, so our special cases. We had a, a few places in the body where blood flow is controlled by another mechanism on top of this. In the kidney, blood flow is uh, controlled through the tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. Um, if that sounds complicated, that's good because it is. <laughs> and we're going to talk about it in the renal chapter, okay? Um, but short version is the blood flow through the glomerulus is controlled by how much urine is produced, um, which is a good thing for making urine. Wouldn't make sense in any other part of the body, though. In the brain, CO2 and hydrogen ions both are substantial dilators um, to the extent that it doesn't matter what the cause is. If your PCO2 is elevated or your pH is low, you will have increased blood flow to the brain. 
Um, and this comes up clinically, of course, because the brain's in a confined space, right? So if we put extra blood flow into a confined space, we have a potential problem. More on that later. And then on the, um, the, the last special case is skin. The, the flow of blood through the skin has very little to do with metabolism, okay? Our skin, while important, is not particularly busy, right, in terms of burning through um, metabolites. But our skin is the way we radiate heat into the world. So blood flow through the skin is controlled for um, body temperature changes more than it's controlled for any other reason. So for example, when you're warm, you know, you've been exercising, so you've generated a bunch of heat, you circulate more blood through your skin to get rid of that heat out into the environment. On a cold winter day, it's the opposite. Your blood flow stays centrally and skips your skin so that you're not radiating your precious body heat out into the cold world, right? Um, so those are just our special cases. <clears throat> we have to talk a little bit about endothelial-derived factors. Have you talked about endothelial cells in MedPath yet? Doesn't maybe sound like it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so endothelial cells are the epithelial cells that line blood vessels. And for, well, since the dawn of medicine, people just kind of assumed that they didn't do anything. You know, that they were like paint on the walls, right? That, you know, nice to have, but not really active. We know that isn't true anymore. Endothelial cells play a major role in managing the cardiovascular system. Um, so for example, the cells that line the, the walls of vessels, they respond to things like um, shear stress, okay? The harder thing to describe, but if you take a lot of liquid and run it through a very small pipe, okay, you're gonna have a lot of drag of the liquid on the walls of the pipe, right? We call that shear stress. You're sort of dragging fluid across the surface of the vessel. The endothelial cells detect this shear stress. They release nitric oxide, and that nitric oxide causes dilation of the upstream arteries. So <clears throat> pushing a lot of fluid through a narrow pipe causes the upstream pipes to get bigger, right? This is a good thing. It helps to match supply and demand. So nitric oxide is one way these cells respond. Endothelin is another. Endothelin is released in response to vessel injury. Okay, so now we're talking trauma. Please always remember surgery is trauma, right? You know, when you're cutting through things, that's traumatic. So like in an a, in a operation, um, we are cutting through vessels. Each vessel we cut through releases endothelin. Endothelin is a powerful vasoconstrictor, right? It makes sense. The last thing you want for a, a bleeding vessel is for it to be vasodilated, right? Vasoconstriction brought about by endothelin helps us with hemostasis. In other words, keeping our blood in our bodies and not out on the ground, right? So when we damage a blood vessel, the vessels constrict and allow less blood flowing through the damaged vessel, therefore less blood loss, right? Which is a good thing. So these are other examples of how um, vessels are controlled at the local level, in this case through the endothelial systems. Okay, so that's acute control. In other words, we're, we, we make changes in seconds to minutes on a tissue by tissue basis so that blood flow matches the needs of the, of the tissue. Well, long-term control is looking at um, the, not seconds to minutes, but hours to days to months. All right, so acute control is fast, but it, it never is perfect. It misses perfection by 10 to 15%. Plus, acute control has no system for dealing with a long-term change in behavior. You know, so let's say you've never been a runner before and you take up running as a hobby. 
the acute control system doesn't have any way to manage that, right? So we need to have another system, and that's where these long-term controls come in. So for example, in my, in my running analogy, if a seldom used tissue suddenly becomes often used or used much more often, well, acute control will fail because there isn't enough blood vessels to bring the resources that that muscle needs. You know, you can imagine, um, you know, a, a bicep, if, if it changes size quite dramatically depending on how you use it, right? A larger bicep needs more blood vessels to supply more blood to more myofibrils, right? Acute control doesn't have a system for that. But we do have a long-term control, and, and that's angiogenesis. Vascularity, or how many vessels are present in a tissue, is a variable. It's something the tissue can affect and control, and the cardiovascular system can respond to. So when a tissue is oxygen starved on a regular basis, in other words, it's, it exceeds its blood flow um, often enough, we get the trigger for angiogenesis. Now, angiogenesis is growth of new blood vessels. It's a very, very complicated process. There's 12 different factors, and the way that they interact is complicated. I'm not sure how much you'll cover that in MedPath, but we don't really talk about it at all in here. Um, <clears throat> I just want you to know it exists. Angiogenesis is the response of tissue to chronic flow limitation, not getting enough blood flow in a chronic way. What does angiogenesis do? Well, it develops new blood vessels. So you get new capillary beds, you get new arterioles, and you get new arteries and veins to supply them. Kind of a neat trick, growing new blood vessels. It's probably why it's so complicated. Like even tumors have to do some angiogenesis, right? And they have to grow in new blood vessels in order to supply itself. So like we know our bodies can do this. So when you train a muscle for a sport, one of the things you're doing you're not just increasing the number and strength of the myofibrils, but you're also increasing the vascularity of that region so that um, it has better oxygen and metabolite uh, delivery. Another place that we see vascularity is in collateral circulation. By now in the anatomy lab, you've seen plenty of collaterals, right? A collateral is just an alternate path for blood to flow through a tissue. <clears throat> and having more paths uh, for blood to flow into a tissue means more blood can flow more regularly, right? And in the muscular system in particular, collateral circulation is important because sometimes the nature of muscle contraction squeezes closed a vessel, right? So, you know, at maximal contraction, you may be partially occluding one of the arteries supplying your bicep, but because you have collaterals, when one artery is occluded, others are open, so you still have blood flow to the muscle, right? So collateral circulation is another outcome of uh, vascularity or angiogenesis. <clears throat> now, um, so we have growth of new vessels. Another version of long-term control is remodeling of existing vessels to better suit how you, the person, are using that particular tissue, right? We have four different kinds of remodeling that occur, and they occur in response to different features. All right, so way at the top, A, we'll call it top one. In small vessels that um, have vasoconstriction, in response to an increase in blood pressure, they undergo remodeling like we see in A. So we get a thicker wall, okay, and a smaller lumen. This better matches what this vessel is doing all the time, which if, if a blood vessel is exposed to high pressure um, and is a small vessel, well, it has to get a thicker wall to resist that pressure. Right? So we see that inward eutrophic remodeling. So the lumen gets smaller, the wall gets thicker. 
In B, we have hypertrophic remodeling. This occurs in larger vessels that, that are not constricting in response to high blood pressure, but are nonetheless um, experiencing an increase in blood pressure over time. So here what we get, we get thicker walls, but the walls kind of grow out instead of in. So the lumen is the same size, but the wall gets thicker, right? So general rule of thumb, when a blood vessel is exposed to high pressures, the wall gets thicker, right? Okay, now if we look at C, if we have an area of increased blood flow over time, so in other words, we have an area that's being used often, we get outward remodeling, which increases the lumen diameter, the pipe gets bigger, right? But the wall doesn't get bigger very much. So this vessel is still doing the same job, it's just conducting more blood flow than it used to, right? We see this kind of change, outward remodeling, in muscle very often, right? So if you have somebody who, you know, let's say they start lifting weights, well, you will have vessels that are increasing their size without increasing their wall um, strength or size, all right? Now, in D, we have the combo. This is a vessel experiencing both increased pressure and increased flow. And here we get both effects. We get increased lumen diameter and we get increased wall thickness. So the general rule of thumb is high pressure over time gets you thicker walls. High flow over time gets you a larger diameter. Okay, Both of those <clears throat> physiologically make sense. Now, the only downside is with A, okay, you have a high pressure and you're, you're making the, the lumen smaller, right? So if you have high pressure and a smaller lumen, you're further increasing the pressure, but that's not what these vessels are doing. What they're trying to do is keep the flow from being too great in a vessel that has too much pressure, right? So we have our four ways of remodeling, all of which are part of long-term control because they affect um, the, uh, <clears throat> how the vessels perform and behave um, <clears throat> over the weeks to months. All right, so then we have humoral control. Okay, so acute control is happening at the lever of the capillary bed, right? Long-term control is structural. So we're talking about growing new vessels or changing vessel size, wall size, all that. Humoral control, that word humor, okay, it's not the funny kind, it's the liquid kind, all right? So humoral just means um, <coughs> liquid signal, all right? It's an ancient word. It comes from um, the ancient Greeks before we understood medicine at all. Uh, there was this thought that humans have four humors, four liquids that make us exist, make us possible. Right? So today when we talk about humoral, usually what we're talking about is hormones, chemical signaling, that kind of stuff. So humoral control of blood pressure is the, the molecules that are released from different parts of the body and have effects on things like vasoconstriction, vasodilation, heart rate, things like that. All right, so two we've talked about already. Norepi and epi both come from the sympathetic nervous system. And <clears throat> while much of the norepi comes through the neurologic system, we still have the adrenal gland, right? The adrenal gland functions like a ganglion, but it doesn't have axons. Instead, the adrenal gland, when it's stimulated, it just dumps its hormone, it dumps its neurotransmitter, for lack of a better term, into the bloodstream instead of into a synapse. Otherwise, it works the same. So norepi and epi um, both are potent vasoconstrictors. And <clears throat> so if I, I can give you epi and you will vasoconstrict all over your body. How the sympathetic nervous system does that is through the adrenal gland and through the innervation of all your arteries with sympathetic nervous system um, uh, axons, right? So epi and norepi are vasoconstrictors. Angiotensin II 
is another potent vasoconstrictor. And this, the reason there's a yay there is it's the first time I get to say this in the class. Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, another favorite of mine. You're going to learn all about it if you don't already. Well, angiotensin II is the second version of angiotensin in the RAAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And we'll talk at length about that, but angiotensin of all those is the most potent of the vasoconstrictors. Angiotensin II is. Um, <clears throat> you'll also learn about this in um, pharmacology because you'll learn about the ACE inhibitor the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, which blocks angiotensin one becoming angiotensin two, right? So more on that later. Another potent vasoconstrictor, vasopressin, also called antidiuretic hormone, also called desmopressin, okay? Um, <clears throat> the uh, vasopressin is a very powerful vasoconstrictor, as, as not surprisingly by its name. Um, vaso, uh, ADH is also important in the management of plasma volume, and we'll talk about how that works when we get into our renal section. But essentially, ADH, I like to call it a desert hormone, antidiuretic hormone, a desert hormone, because if you are water deprived, ADH plays your biggest role. Okay, it's our fluid conserving hormone. It reduces the amount of urine you make, it reduces the, your water losses from all causes, and it's a vasoconstrictor to keep you alive until you can replace your fluids. Um, now, all of these, this is a theme, still trumped by autoregulation, right? So even if, I'll give you an example. Um, I've given you a milligram of epi. So your blood pressure is now 180 over 90, okay? So, in your busy tissues, autoregulation is still going to win out. Even though I have you all vasoconstricted and your blood pressure is super high, in the, in the tissues that aren't busy, you'll have a normal blood flow, right? Because autoregulation is managing that at that level. So, even though your blood pressure is high, blood flow through your bicep, for example, is going to be normal because they're going to be more vasoconstricted right? Um, or if your blood pressure is too low, well, you're still going to have, um, as long as you have enough blood pressure to drive blood flow, you'll still have normal uh, flow through your um, bicep, to use my example there. So those are the vasoconstrictors. We have a few vasodilators. Honestly, we pay them much less attention than the vasoconstrictors. The vasoconstrictors play a role in our everyday physiology. Vasodilators are more about injury. So we have bradykinin and histamine. Um, bradykinin is released actually by the blood in response to injury, and it causes massive vasodilation and increased capillary permeability. Um, have you talked about bradykinin as part of the inflammatory cascade at all? Um, it can be. Now, histamine, you've talked about histamine, though. Also a potent vasodilator. Um, histamine's role is primarily in... Uh, damage control and repair, right? You know, the idea behind histamine is if you've got damage to a tissue, that tissue needs more resources in order to fix itself and repair itself. And histamine um, allows that. It causes vasodilation and increased capillary permeability. So we get the raw materials we need for um, repair and uh, recovery. Then we do have some ions that play a role. Not surprisingly, calcium's top of the list, right? So calcium causes vasoconstriction direct effect. This goes all the way back to how smooth muscle cells work, right? Smooth muscle cells contract when calcium is around. The more calcium you have around a smooth muscle cell, the more it will contract, right? So that one's easy to understand. Potassium tends to cause vasodilation by inhibiting contraction. Um, it does this by uh, uh, hyperpolarizing the cell membrane, right? So drive the membrane potential down into the you know, negative 60, negative 90 area, and that cell will have a much more difficult time contracting because its calcium channels will be closed. Magnesium causes vasodilation. Again, it's an inhibitor of contraction. 
Um, we actually use magnesium clinically um, to control preterm labor, of all things. And uh, I use that as an example because the uterus is smooth muscle, right? If we, get, if we elevate the magnesium concentration of a woman who's in preterm labor, we essentially put the uterus to sleep, which gives the baby a, you know, however many days, weeks um, to further develop before being delivered. So magnesium increases vasodilation. An increase in hydrogen ions, in other words, a lower pH um, causes vasodilation. A slight decrease in pH causes vasoconstriction. Slight is in bold or in caps there because a big decrease in hydrogen ion concentration makes the vasoconstrictors sick, right? So then they can't vasoconstrict and they dilate. But generally speaking, a small decrease causes vasoconstriction like you'd see physiologically in a tissue that had too much blood flow. Acetate citrate, both of those cause mild vasodilation and an increase in CO2 typically causes vasodilation as we've been talking about, right? It's one of the signs of a busy tissue. So it's one of the auto-regulation, auto-regulatory mechanisms. This CO2 and vasodilation plays a major role in the brain. Um, we'll talk, not at length, but we'll talk a little bit about how respiration is controlled and this plays a role there. All right, and that is it for our introduction to regulation and control.